Today's episode of the Bill Simmons Podcast brought to you by SeatGeek, our presenting sponsor, the easiest way to shop for the best tickets thanks to their revolutionary grading system. You use SeatGeek, Jim Miller? I, I don't. Oh, man. if you, you that, That's good for you. You're a first-timer. That means you get $10 off baseball tickets. First time you use SeatGeek, just use promo code BSMOB. Uh, download the SeatGeek app today or go right to SeatGeek.com. Also brought to you by House of Carbs, our new smash hit food podcast. I went on the second episode of my buddy House. We talked meatballs. We talked hot dogs. We talked brujols. We talked what's the best Vegas dinner. Good times. People like this podcast. Subscribe to it now. Uh, speaking of subscriptions, we are done with Game of Thrones binge mode. Um, it almost killed Mallory Rubin. You saw her in the office, Brian. I, I've seen her the last couple months. Yeah, we have to like replace all of her It looks like we need blood. the paddles to come out and yeah, just revive right. Mallory. <laughs> <laughs> they taped 60 episodes in like two months. It's finally done. We're posting the last five uh, later this week. People love this pod too. Subscribe to it now. You can catch up right before the Game of Thrones comes back Sunday night. And after it's done, you can go on Twitter. Go on at Ringer and watch our Talk the Thrones postgame show. One of, the, one of my biggest flaws in show. the cultural gap, gap. I've never seen an episode. Really? Never. My dad, thanks to this Binge Bone podcast, watched 60 episodes in two weeks. Now, he's retired, and he watched it on his iPad, but he did 60 episodes in two weeks, and, and he was just sucked in. So you'll get when you get sucked in, you'll binge them. Yeah. Anyway, uh, Talk the Thrones, Twitter, Sunday night. Coming up, James Andrew Miller. Brian Curtis. We're going to talk media, ESPN, a whole bunch of stuff. But first, Pearl Jam. All right. The three man. Oh, my gosh. I'm honored. The Ringer's editor at large, Brian Curtis. Jim Miller. Author of the CAA book, bestseller, ESPN book, bestseller, SNL oral history with Tom Shales, bestseller. I don't know what you're up to now. Well, you're you're working on a a podcast for down the road that you announced. Uh, Right. Origins. Is that what it's called? Origins. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to look at beginnings of things in movies, television, sports, uh, music, relationships. (laughs) We want to talk ESPN. Lots of stuff for going on has been going on in 2017. I've heard, I've read some of the stuff. I've heard some of the stuff. I made the mistake. I went. I did uh, the Vox conference and got asked an ESPN question, and in three minutes, uh, opened the Pandora's box for about 40 different conversations. I should have just shut my mouth. What's the over under age for now. you when you think you'll be not asked an ESPN question? Is there one? I think it's my whole life. Yeah. Right? I think so. Until the bitter end, I think I'll be like 68. ESPN will not even exist anymore. It'll be some sort of uh, video on demand channel. That I think just it's has not like a stain, USC. it's a tattoo. Yeah, it's a tattoo. Hey, man, I worked there for 14 and a half years, you know? Yeah. Um, but anyway, we there's so much going on. I haven't been totally happy with the with the analysis of it. So I thought we could do that now. Okay. So first of all, they cleaned house. Skipper finally has an inner circle, John Skipper, who took over basically in 2012. Um, now he has a new inner circle in place. Connor Shell, who I created 30 for 30 with. He's in charge of content. Burke Magnus is in charge of scheduling. And then Justin Connolly is in charge of the business side. And that's it. That's the new inner circle. Why did it take five years for this to happen? I think in in part because when Skipper took the job, I really believe he thought that he could continue to be, to do his old job as well, which was the head of content. First of all, it's what he loves. Yeah. It's second of all, it's what he's best at. And third of all, I don't think he wanted to let go of it. And so that combination I think was really powerful. Um, You know, he tells this story about how before he became president of ESPN, he used to go to Disney and he'd always forget his ID and they'd be looking and they have to call. There's this, he was head of content, but they didn't, you know, uh, there's this guy, John Skipper at the gate, you know, whatever. And the day that the first time he went to Disney after becoming president, he pulled up to the booth and they go, 
oh, good morning, Mr. Skipper, and opens it right away. Yeah. Like, there's a big difference between being president of ESPN and everything else. And I think that, um, I don't, uh, Skipper's not naive, but I don't think he appreciated it. So I think that one of the things that happened, particularly during the first two years, was you were looking at an ESPN organizationally where you thought, oh, yeah, Bodenheimer's still president. Like if I told you like how the place was operating and the direct reports and the fact that, you know, everybody stayed basically like you think that, you know, Bodenheimer was still running it. Some guys come in, become president and they they just they know what they want to do. They clean house, they change everything. He didn't do that. What was your take from afar, Brian? Um, I, I agree with what Jim said, but also it's like, how do we think of this as how much of ESPN right now is a business problem? And how much is a content problem? And what, you know, how do those two things, you know, I'd, I'd be interested in getting Jim's take on that. If you had to pick right now, give percentages, what do you think those two are for those two things? Um, I think it's probably more of a business problem because um, the, the, the industry is changing so fast. The technology is, is a wild card and distribution is just a minefield for them. So I think that it's one of the reasons why, you know, people have asked me, if God forbid Skipper got hit by a bus tomorrow, which of those three takes over. And I think Justin has the, the inside lane because of so many of the challenges. The future is, is in his pile. But that's not to say the content isn't important, but I, I definitely think the business side of the equation is, is keeping them up at night. So I was the closest to Skipper probably 09 through 2013. And when he got that job, which was the tail end of 2011, but he really didn't get it till the summer of 2012. And Bodenheimer was staying on. He was like a liaison. Chairman. Yeah. They kind of, they created a new title for George. And well, no, Skipper, Steve had kind of done that when George became president. Steve, Steve Bornstein. But then he left and it was just kind of vacant. Yeah. And then, so they put him in and it, and Skipper was, you know, it's, this is going to be great. It's good for everybody. It seemed weird that he he wasn't going to replace himself, and that it, as it was happening, I was watching it going. So you're going to do George's job, which George's job is basically you fly everywhere. You're on an airplane all the time. You're going to Burbank for a meeting every week. You're just immersed in the business side, but then also try to do the content job. And the thing with Skipper, and I'll defend him to the death on this. He's great on content. He great taste. I would say he's had the best taste of anybody who ran ESPN. And a lot of the stuff that he did, especially from, I don't know, 08 to 2012, was just lights out, really smart, really forward thinking. Now all of a sudden he's doing this other job. It's a little like in the NBA when people are coaching and they're the GM at the same time. And you just can't, like Doc Rivers, you just can't do both jobs. So we, uh, we all thought, well, he's going to, He'll, he'll, he'll figure out who his number two is. It'll happen. And then six months passed and nine months passed and 12 months passed. And it became clear it was bullpen by committee. And I think that was his biggest mistake. I think he thought these direct reports that he had, which was like John Wildhack, Norby, uh, John Kozner, all these people could just kind of collectively do his old job. And it's wrong. You need somebody who has the taste, who has who's the tastemaker and the content maker, basically. Well, and that's I, when the wheels came off. I think there's another component, which we're, which is worth mentioning, which is, you know, ESPN Bristol is like a biosphere sometime. Yeah. And so after becoming president, Skipper also had the possibility, God forbid, of looking outside the, that current ESPN ecosystem. Right. And there's a lot of really talented content people out there that, you know, you may want to say, I think I got to shake the culture up. And I think that, you know, we have to at least have a voice in here that's different than what we've all been saying to each other around media. But look meetings. at ESPN for 30 plus years for, to that point, totally resistant to go outside. That's the whole, that's, but that, 06 if, if, was the only time they went and got Joan Lynch, Connor, um, Jamie Horowitz, Kevin Wilds, like I met Wilds might have already been there, but that was the only time I remember like new blood. Like, who are these people? Where well, they could have been from? saying, we could have been sitting around here thinking, boy, you know, it was amazing when, uh, when Skipper became president, he really brought other voices into the room. He got, you know, this one from here and this one from here. And, you know, it was just a whole different kind of mix, but he certainly didn't do that at all. In fact, he resisted it. So there's two theories for this, Brian. Jim and I have too much inside information. I'm interested to see what you think. Okay. Theory one is 
Skipper genuinely thought if he had the bullpen by committee and he and he could do both jobs and he could kind of float in and out that it would basically be as good as it was. Theory two is the survivor TV show type of mentality <laughs> of if I if I anoint my number two, that becomes my successor. And if for whatever reason things don't go well, then it becomes that guy who's or that girl who's looming behind me. And he never there was never that person. So he he basically made it impossible for him not to be the lead guy because there was no successor in place. What do you believe? I think that's I, I like the second theory. <laughs> Just to, from afar, I think that's sort of fascinating. It also though, can't you do that and say, let's see, let's give people time and see who comes out who comes out of the crowd, right? You would so you like, would think that, but I mean we knew who all the people were. None of them all of them were kind of promoted either as high as they should have been or maybe even one spot too high. So there was no there was no next you wouldn't have bet on any of them. But didn't it was like, oh, so this guy presided over a movie that won an Oscar. That's something in unprecedented in ESPN history and something was unthinkable a couple of years ago, right? Yes. ESPN would take home an Academy Award. Right. So, ooh, that that guy looks good. That guy, that guy gets that gets the big prize. Right. That and there, took there's five certain, years to there's get certain there. logic in that. Yeah, but I mean, that's the, in 2017. At the end of it anyway. But in 2012. Another theory of Skip It that's interesting to me is great peacetime general. Ooh. ESPN making money hand over fist, right? 30 for 30. Grantland. You know, we're making money. We can <laughs> Grantland do Grantland wasn't making money Sorry. hand over fist. No, no, no. Sorry. The big, the big company. Is, <laughs> when, we're, when we have money to spend, we <laughs> right. can do this. We yes. can do this. We can invest quality content, right? Not, not silly stuff, but 30 for 30. Grant, things people will remember. Wartime general, John Skipper. When money gets tighter, when you have to lay people off, is he that guy? What do you think about that, Jim? Well, first of all, he is that guy because we've got 400 people less now <laughs> right. than, than... Is he good I mean, at, Is he good at being that guy? I think he's better than some people would have predicted because he is a uh, hail fellow well met. I mean, he's he's not a he's not a suit. He's not a, you know, pencil pushing numbers guy. He is a very uh, collegial guy. And I, I think that I, I do believe that it took a lot out of him, the 300 and and the 100. He doesn't like that. Um, there, are, there, are, there are executives who live for that kind of stuff. Um, so I think he was equal to the challenge of that. Um, but that's not to say that the other scenario doesn't exist. Look, for the last five years of Skipper's Reign, there, this is, I think it's the first time since 1983 where ESPN didn't have a successor inside and you kind of knew it. Or even, even a, 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 an abundance of them, several of them to choose from. But um, he really, really um, secured himself that top perch um, in a way that I, I don't think uh, I don't think anybody had before. I think part of what makes ESPN's story so fascinating this decade is it follows a lot of the same beats when you look in the past. Companies that, when things turn for them, they just had no idea it was going to turn because things have been going well for so long. The business model and everything it had just been had been lights out perfect and i think when you have that for a while your mentality becomes how do we keep this how do we keep this formula instead of thinking this formula is going to change we need to you know let's look at the chessboard we need to be seven moves ahead they were never seven moves ahead they were always behind and the big the biggest things i noticed 2011 2012 2013 you know technology was I thought what they the biggest thing they should have invested in, and you know you, their mentality was we have to protect Sports Center. How do we fix Sports Center? Well, let's build the giant set. Let's build this state of the art one hundred and fifty million dollar set. Let's double down on on uh, how it looks, and and they weren't thinking about things like what if everything is digital in ten years. We, our website in 2013, 14, first of all, it took, it would take us like a year to redesign everything because they were outsourcing so much of it. But even when we had like 30, 30 shorts, things like that, when we would run them on ESPN.com, this, the videos would freeze and we would have all these internal discussions about these videos are freezing. Like the, <laughs> the audience hates this. They, can we just put these on YouTube? And we would have our shorts, our ground things, any of the stuff we were doing. 
and they didn't want to put them on YouTube because it was harder to sell the ads. Like, no, no, we got to keep them on, on ESPN.com. And it's like, yeah, but when they're on ESPN.com, they, they freeze and people don't watch them. And it was just, to me, the technology was the big miss because ESPN.com should have become SportsCenter and should have become the fuel of all the stuff they innovated with. And now they're belatedly doing it because they bought into BAM. That they get it now. I feel like they should have gotten it in 2012. I mean, look, I can convict or acquit on the digital center. I do think that the digital center, uh, you know, because Sports Center was such a big part of it and the big stage and everything else, it soaked up a lot of oxygen. It does deliver for them a lot of solutions for digital operations, hence its name. Yes. That, you know, has, in, has made life a lot easier for them and things a lot more efficient. Having said that, Look, they went through the 3D experiment, which was, you know, quite deleterious to the bottom line. That was a rare loss for Bodenheimer, who I think is a brilliant guy and yeah. did unbelievable stuff for them. But it was he a was rare like loss very for bullish Chuck Pagano, on 3D. Their CTO, yeah, who's who was magnificent, had one of the great you know CTO careers ever. But I, I do think that look, they they saw digital in certain ways, and then they started to to move. There were many times that they were in front, but there were many times that they were behind. And I think that one of the things that happened in 2015, 2016 is they were so glad to have escaped the Washington lobbyist thing on a la carte that they didn't realize about the cord cutting, particularly with the young generation and even the notion of like skinnier bundles. Um, that I think, look, 13 million households over over that period, over the past several years, losing those that that was tough and i don't think they had anything like that in mind it amazes me as we as they pivot to use a terrible word we keep hearing lately to the future yeah how much like when you watch if you watch espn all day which nobody really does but if you did it's just how the much, same show how much twitter programs every show <laughs> right. like a funny like here's here's clay thompson dancing yeah and that's on the jump and that's on the six and that's on sports nation and that's on this and it's like they're doing on television what we're all doing at our desks here at the ringer which is here's something funny on Twitter. Should we write about it? Should yeah. we react to it? Should we post it? Should We're we in our joke? Slack. Talking Should we about make it. jokes about it? Yeah. Should yeah. we slack about it? Like that. Actually, Bristol's doing the Bristol car wash. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. With a piece of not with Dak Prescott, though they do that too, but with a piece of weird internet content. And it just filters through because it's like we know people aren't watching television. We know younger people aren't watching television like they used to. So how can we weirdly react to Twitter? I think that's fascinating to me. People don't believe me on this, but. In 2013, they had no idea the cord cutting was coming. It, like literally none. There was no hint of it. Their whole attitude in, in 2013 was, wh that was the year they did uh, Oberman, right? Or was that 2014? 14, I believe. <sighs> I'm trying to remember now. I want to say it was later than 13. but It was, four, it was 14. It was, 13, it was like flexing your muscles. We're just raking. I think 13 was the biggest revenue year they had and the biggest profit they made all that stuff then when fox came 14 it was then it became oh how dare fox challenges challenges us that, you, you know that was a weird moment though i think look the moat was pretty big yeah skipper had gone out and spent a ton of money you know close to 27 billion dollars over college football engineered longer deals than anybody had ever done in the business i mean you can't have a bigger moat at that point so I mean, I think it's easy to say this in Monday morning quarterbacking way, but I, I said it at the time, I think that they overreacted to Fox One. There are several ESPN talent now who are enjoying gargantuan salaries compared <laughs> to what they used to make right. because there was like even like a sniff like, oh, Fox might want them as all of a sudden it's like double their salary, triple their salary. I to think keep it them. was 13. I think 13 you know what? was you when, may be right. You because may be right. that was when they like Sage was starting to go to Fox and they, they did that contract, but they had Whitlock. They were trying to get at that point, I think. I mean, Oberman was actually not an, not an expensive deal given Keith's history and given what they pay other people. I but, know, but I know for a fact they were like, oh, really? Fox is going to challenge us? Watch this. I mean, it was like somebody trying to challenge the Yankees in 2002. It was like, oh, we'll just go get Kevin Brown. I mean... And then a year later was when the cord cutting stuff started because that summer the ratings started to go down and they were just completely flummoxed by it. Why is this happening? Because it was the year they had the World Cup and 
I remember there was this email that uh, the person who does the analytics for all that stuff sent this long email trying to figure out what the causes were. And one of the reasons that they theorized was World Cup fatigue. <laughs> that after <laughs> World Cup, after the World Cup, ESPN viewers were fatigued with ESPN. You're too tired but to push the button on your email, remote. Yeah. In this email, they, they also was like, another possibility is that younger viewers are going right to court to uh streaming services like roku they listed all these things it was like yeah that that was the reason actually because your younger viewers are now just and their phones cutting and that's it and going to phones and i just don't think they saw any of it coming i never heard the word um subs until 2000, 2014 used in a way like we're losing subs mm -hmm. And that was the game changer. They thought that when he did the NBA deal, they thought the subs were going to be a fixed thing. I've talked about this on the podcast before. When they started going down, I was like, wait, what? what? I thought it was going to stay here. And, you know, they just didn't see it. Now, the question is, should they have seen it? Should they have anticipated that? It's a really hard thing to anticipate. You need somebody that is just dialed into where shit's going. Well, who was, though? I mean, right. like in Burbank, there's a strategic group there. There's an abundance of people looking at the industry outside of ESPN. When you look back, I, I don't think a lot of people were talking about it. I'm sure there was somebody or so, uh, but the truth is that I don't think anybody in, at Disney or ESPN was really thinking about it. I mean, you got to include, you got to include Disney in that. You know what I'm thinking about? A legendary sandwich. <laughs> it's more than a sandwich. It's a sub. It's a damn good one at that. Jersey Mike's. I love their number 44, the Buffalo chicken cheesesteak with Frank's red hot sauce, lettuce, tomato, blue cheese dressing. We've done Jersey Mike's at the Ringer office, right? We have one right I, I down the street. Was, I think I was gone that day, but I do, you were it, gone? I do it personally on my own quite quite often. I, I actually did it yesterday. Fantastic. The giant Jersey Mike subs got even more legendary because now you can order from Jersey Mike's online. Right now, if you do it online, Jersey Mike's will hook you up with 10% off one of the best names for a food place oh absolutely jersey mike's you just kind of know what it is it's uh since 1956 jersey mike's has been piling their subs high with sliced to order meats cheeses and fresh veggies i spent the first 32 years of my life in new england nothing's more delicious than an authentic east coast style sub so whether you're flying solo buying for the squad playing office hero like i did last month order smarter with jersey <laughs> mike's online once again get 10 percent off when you order online at jerseymikes.com bs get in get out Get eating at jerseymikes.com slash BS. When I went yesterday, somebody was playing Office Hero and it was kind of annoying because they had like six giants that they were making. And they right just me and I just, yeah. it was like a, it was like a 10 minute yeah. wait. Yeah. You're just waiting it out. Um, but funny about doing it, doing a read for a podcast. Cause you know, I think one of the problems that ESPN fell into, not a huge problem. They're going to make, ESPN's fine. They're good. They're always going to make money. They're just not going to make as much money as they did four years ago, but they were operating like this giant Starbucks conglomerate. And part of the issues they had was like with smaller stuff. How do you sell smaller things? How do you sell something like Grantland? How do you create a podcast network? How do you deal with all these different advertisers and sponsors when you're going to like Chevrolet and Subway and they're just cutting you $50 million checks or $200 million checks or whatever. And as part of that deal, it's like, we are your fast food person. You can't go anywhere else. Can I go back to your previous sentence though? Because yeah. ESPN is going to be fine. That's true. Except I believe that the name of the game right now, forget about content, forget about quality, forget about which thing. It's all about Wall Street. And it's all about Disney and Wall Street. Okay. And Dis and Wall Street is home of what have you done for me lately? Right. And so the reason why I think this is such a critical time for ESPN is what is the narrative that Disney gets to say to Wall Street about growth? I, I it's not going to be at the rate it used to be. I mean, for what, seven years, they're getting 20% compounded increases on their sub fees. Yeah. Uh, that, Which that's, is unrealistic. That's enough to make you a Bolshevik. And you yeah. can't, and you can never <laughs> replace that. You'll never replace that. So it's like, so where's it going to come from? Because this is like, uh, you know, in some ways, you got, you got a loan from, from like the mafia, and there's like, I, we don't care, pay up. Pay up, pay up, pay up. So it's, you can't go, Bob Iger can't go on an investor call and say, listen, ESPN's gonna be fine. We're, we're fine. It's always gonna make money. That's not enough. It's like, how are you gonna solve this problem of, P, of dwindling subscribers 
and still spending a ton of money. I mean, I was shocked by the Big Ten deal. I, everybody, I mean, this was after cord cutting. After, this yeah. is after we knew about cord cutting, and they still spent a fortune. But that's yeah. a, that's a Fox thing too, right? Because Fox was in for for at exactly. least half, and exactly. then you thought, oh, are we going to get right. bought out of the Big Ten? Right. But the end, but the NBA deals too. When, I mean, these are expensive deals. They're still spending the money. So I don't. I mean, that's that's the moment in time we're at right now, which is how do you create a growth story from a mature company that literally has its best profit days possibly behind it so can we all agree that you do the nba deal every time you don't do you any percent of you think they actually shouldn't have done that that was a mistake no you have to well first of all you have to because you have eight thousand seven hundred sixty hours to play around with and you can't it just can't all be Stephen Smith. Right. Uh, I mean, so you got to, the, the original strategy. I think it might someday be Stephen <laughs> Smith. That's it. That might be the only person the, on ESPN. Yes, the the S in ESPN will be for Stephen Smith. But um, <laughs> the one thing that Skipper did that was great right from the beginning was he just decided, because Shapiro, God love him, he wanted to develop shows and he was trying this show and this show. And Skipper was like, okay, it's all about live. I, I, you know, we'll get to those things all. But he just went out on the biggest Steinbrenner-esque buying spree of all time and bought up everything he could. So I agree with you. But you I know, actually agreed with it at the time. I thought it made sense. I still think. By the way, what well, what do you think the what do you think the hemorrhaging would be if they didn't have the NBA? I mean, you right. have to, well, or the NFL. Well, I, I mean, the, they need the, the they, existential question would be dialed up. What is this network for, right? If they don't have all these games, you know, that question would be louder and louder. And louder. Right. I mean, now you're 1982. Yeah, right. you're doing the cheerleading championships on a Friday night. <laughs> right. I mean, you have to have the NFL because that helps your your surcharges. There's no question. You can't get seven you, bucks of nobody's household. getting out of business with the NFL. It never that, happened. That's it. You can't do that. And but you got to go for the NBA. Now that doesn't mean though. Look, we're in a quiet law. So baseball's coming up, everything's coming up. Does Disney say to them though, you know what, you're not gonna have that money to buy baseball this time. At I see, I don't think they should have bought baseball last time. I thought when people talk about, oh, they paid this, like, like first of all, as we discussed on the pod, Brian, NFL, NBA, you're not just getting the games, you're getting all the highlights, you're getting unlimited access to all the content, which fuels every single show you have. And they have all these talking head shows where, if they didn't run the highlights, and I was in this situation with my HBO show, and you're, we just weren't allowed to use football highlights. We're talking football. You know what helps when when two people are just talking is running highlights. You know what they're talking <laughs> about. Still photos weren't working. No, still photos and like anime. It just doesn't. That's work. why that 1.9 billion they spent. That's the long form deal. Yeah, because people are like they didn't get a playoff game. It's like they don't care. They wanted the highlights. That's that's what mattered to them. Yeah, and keeping the the uh, Monday Night Football franchise. But um, same thing with NBA. NBA is a little more diplomatic about being able to use their footage, but at the same time, it's like they're all in, they're on the court, they're they're in every step of the way. They're the like the league's best the NBA partner. Is the off season is just as yeah, exciting. It's a ten month so, sport. I mean, they, you got all these trades mm -hmm. and people are following. You got experts. I mean, you got vertical coming back to ESPN because they believe in that so much. Oh, we got a talk whole about other story. So, but the baseball <laughs> when it happened, I actually remember talking to Skipper about it, and I was like. I don't get this one. Like people don't, you could feel this decade was when people just watched their own baseball Five and a half billion dollars. The yeah. baseball deal was. It was like, you just watch your own That's baseball incredible. team. You, your baseball team is Texas. Right. The Rangers. Do you, are you home on a Tuesday night watching Kansas city versus no, not at all. Anaheim? Not even close. Nobody is. So it was like, and it, as it was explained to me, it was like, it chews up innings. It literally, the, the baseball analogy <laughs> is, an it, inning just, leader, it yeah. literally chews it's up innings. Tonnage, yeah. It fuels baseball tonight. Now, as we found Which out, they've cut back on. Yeah, well, what happened was the RSNs killed uh, killed baseball tonight. Ravitch, I thought, was really interesting talking about it in uh, in Sports Illustrated this week, where he's basically like, every time a game ends, people watch their own teams. The Red Sox game ends. Everyone's on Nesson watching the Nesson post game show. They don't go to ESPN for baseball night. They don't care. They would rather hear Dennis Eckersley talk about whether Dustin Pedroia should have bunted in the seventh inning. They don't care about this big giant macro conversation about the league. And I think that's where I don't. So it was five and a half billion they paid for how long? Mm -hmm. Eight years. See, I don't think they would ever do that again. I think that's where they would. I think they would double down on football and basketball and college. And I think they would get rid of baseball. Well, but here's here's the interesting question now about this next round that's coming up. 
You don't even know who you're competing against. So maybe Fox isn't going to have the money, but what if Jeff Bezos all of a sudden decides to do something or Mark Zuckerberg or, Facebook. or, or you know, yeah, Mark Zuckerberg wants to all of a sudden go deep in baseball. I mean, you have Twitter exploring things. So it may not be the same kind of competitive landscape before. And so you have the rights deals there? Or yeah. do you have when baseball ends? Yeah, 2021. I just don't think they'll have baseball going forward. I don't think it does enough for them. And I think it'll be more valuable to somebody else. Maybe they'll be able to you work out a it's deal. more valuable to MLB Network. Maybe MLB Network just keeps it. Or maybe they'll be able to work out a deal with like a Facebook of the world or whatever. So they're, my only point is, at what point does Disney say, you can't have everything? Yeah, I think we're here. I, mean, I think they, we're at the point. They've said that with employees, right? And they, they said that with employees. And I think, I personally thought it was going to happen before the Big Ten because you could start to see the writing and I was shocked. So I, I think we're going to see a situation where they have to plan for football, NFL first, and that's going to be huge. And they have to engineer the Monday night football rights coming up at the same time as the others, because how, what year is that? <laughs> that otherwise, I mean, NFL, it's 2021 for Monday night football, but it always starts beforehand. Right. It starts quite a bit in advance. So, you know, we'll, we'll see. I mean, look, they already, they're struggling right now. This year, they got a bit of a better schedule. But remember, when they got Monday Night Football, they didn't realize that they were going to come up with more years than not, the fourth worst schedule. Yes. The league all of a sudden started Thursday Night Football. And it's like, so now our the Monday Night Football that we grew up on is like way at the bottom of the pile. And it's like it's punitive on the NFL's part. Like we're going to punish ESPN year after year after year by giving them the absolute dreariest games on Monday night. I mean, that's what it feels like when you look at that schedule. This year was a little better. A little better. But it was all like, you know, going back to that original Sunday night deal, one of the worst, the Sunday night, Monday night switch, one of the worst moments, one of the worst deal making episodes in ESPN history. Oh, yeah. It's like the NFL was so desperate housewives. was so mad and realized they were so desperate. They were like, we're just going to give you the worst schedule they, over they, and over. No, they, they, the NFL wasn't mad. NFL was delighted. Well, delighted because they got them, but they were the last ones onto the boat, right? They were the last ones to get, you know, because everybody else had bought it. I mean, of course, they were happy because they sold it to ESPN. No, I, I get mean, what you Dick mean. Dick Ebersol, I mean. But that schedule was just horrend <laughs> horrendously bad. Why was Dick Ebersol able to butter up the NFL better than Iger and Bodenheimer? Well, first of all, at that time, you have to remember something. Iger didn't have the job. So right. it was this, oh, it, was Eisner. it was the worst. No, but Eisner had already announced he was leaving. Right. So it was the worst timing at all for Disney because I, I remember there was a day when all of a sudden somebody on the board leaked that Meg Whitman was being interviewed for the job. And so it's like Eisner is going to go in for, remember they were losing 700 million, I think on, uh, no, 125 million, I think on, on Sunday night. So wow. you're going to go in front of the board and say, I think we need to do Sunday and Monday. It's a tough thing Remember it was, to do. it was a pretty cheap price though, right? Oh, it, they could have had it for like a, like a billion cheap. point something combined. Very cheap. But you know what? I, I, I will defend Iger to the death on this one because I think it was very, very hard. Also. And you love Desperate thought, Housewives. <laughs> I mean, I <laughs> and they also, got the rest of Oswald, the lucky rabbit back. So right. that, was, that was huge. You got Oswald, <laughs> but they thought they were getting Monday night schedule. Yeah. I mean, so that's another big thing, but you have to also credit Eversol because one of the hardest things to do is after not being in the NFL game and not having the rights to get back in it, that, that was, uh, that was well played. That was well played. He got back in it and he got the best schedule. So we think going forward, 2020s ESPN has NBA. I think they doubled down on NFL, college football, for sure. college hoops. And then a bunch of fringe stuff. But like you the think just, softball World just Series. Monday night on NFL? Do they go for, I mean, can they outbid Les Moonves on Sunday afternoon, which is still Sunday. Those two Sunday afternoon games are the best. I mean, you know, Sunday night, Sunday afternoon, another, you know, clearly you're talking, top dollar. So you're talking 2021. So really it starts 2020? 2019. Yeah. Man, I think, I think some of these big ass streaming places will be ready by then. You're already seeing it. Facebook, Twitter, and uh, Amazon. I mean, they, all of them want live stuff. So consider 60 Minutes without NFL lead-in. Consider Fox without that Sunday afternoon game. No, no way, Fox. I mean, no I don't way. think Moonves ever loses football. CBS, CBS, He's got too many cronies. And CBS knows what that's like. 
they know they made the most the worst mistake in the world by giving up the NFC package and they never they've still never gotten it back you know yeah. they're not going to give up they're not going to give up the AFC no way no but the but the other point is is the bidding going to get so high that it makes it prohibitive for even ESPN to go after it so do you feel like UFC is going to be the first little test case for this cuz one of the biggest reasons WME bought UFC was they felt like they were going to create this bidding war with all these suitors I don't think ESPN's going to bid for UFC. I don't think so. Either. I don't think Fox is going to go gigantic all in. Fox just let the Champions League go. Obviously, they're cutting back a little bit too. Turner just spent on Champions League. That does UFC doesn't feel like a Turner type of thing anyway. NBC Sports isn't going to spend on it. So you start looking at it and you go, oh, who's left for this big giant rights thing that they thought they were going to have? I don't think HBO's in there. I don't think Showtime's in there. So is it like USA? My I, my dark horse pick would be USA, hmm. um, but if if their right stuff doesn't go like the way people thought, I think that's a bad sign for the other stuff. On the other hand, Champions League just went for way more than I ever thought. The Turner thing, I, I was stunned by that. Oh, look, I think you know Mark Shapiro is still very bullish on UFC, and uh, I think well he has to, to be. So their whole company is sunk into it. Right, but I think he said in, I, I read in Darren Ravel's piece yesterday, I think that they're ahead of the numbers that they thought they would be. Um, I don't know if the, I believe that. At this point, I, I, I'm not sure, but Their I know that- Their pay-per-views are like 150,000 a pop and they've actually been doing more of them. But I think the big issue for them is it's so hard for them to keep stars. You've Colin McGregor and then either he gets beat or he stops fighting or he tries to redo his deal or you have Ronda Rousey and all of a sudden she just gets knocked out, she's gone. You know, whereas like the NBA, they know they have LeBron and KD. They know they have all these people for 15 years. It's also a weird thing to buy into because you're not getting the best stuff. Right? The best stuff is going to be pay-per-view. Right. So you're saying I'm going to essentially take in, in college football terms your third tier rights or maybe your second tier rights. But I'm never really going to taste the good stuff. I want to promote you all year. I'm going to do shows about you. And I'm going to get these kind of little middle of the, you know, like marking time kind of events. But I'm never going to get the big events. It's weird. I'm I want to talk about ESPN's digital strategy, but first, uh, Game of Thrones is Sunday night, HBO, July 16th, right afterwards. Our experts will be on our Twitter feed, at Ringer. You can go there. I think I think Twitter's going to pin it at the top of uh, the actual Twitter page, too. Our live recap show, right afterwards. Jason Concepcion, Andy Greenwald, Mallory Rubin, Chris Ryan, maybe some celebrity guests. Ooh. Talk to Thrones, starting Sunday night. Watch the episode. And then just go right there and they'll tell you what the hell happened. Um, ESPN's digital strategy. So they're not replacing Kozner. I'm not surprised. We should talk about that. So Kozner was somebody that uh, was my boss for a while. And I had a good relationship with for a while until after I got suspended. And obviously things changed with me and a lot of people there. But he was out of anyone they had was the only person who at least could have a conversation about where things were going. You know, I remember we went, we went to uh, Silicon Valley like three straight years and saw Apple and Facebook and all these things. And he felt like stuff was happening there. And I, every time we went, I would always be like, why doesn't he spin have an office here? Like, why wouldn't you open up this state of the art instead of like opening another building in Bristol? Why wouldn't you have an office here? Because like, our engineering, all the stuff that we're doing with our web, I'm saying this, you know, at the time, like our website, like we have to outsource stuff. The technology is not good. Like we're just not good at stuff. And all of these engineers are in Silicon Valley and they just, they come out and they just go there because they know if they work at Apple, they can hop to Facebook, they can hop at some startup, they get a piece. And that's where all the action is. And ESPN was sitting it out. Did you ever say that to Kozner? Yeah, we talked about it. And he's like, ah, you know, Bristol, we have so much invested in the campus, all this stuff. I always thought it was crazy they didn't have just a building with 100 people in, I don't know, Cupertino or something. And they could have just grabbed people. I really feel like it's a, it's a technology problem is one of the things that is a real issue for ESPN now. And you look at what... Bleacher Report, this is what I wish I had said at the Vox conference and I, we just ran out of time. Bleacher Report has taken ESPN's corner digitally in a lot of ways. Like they are just way better at social. Um, they're way better at driving traffic. Their team stream app is, the, is better than anything ESPN has. 
and they've really not only taken their corner, but they're like three, four years ahead of where ESPN is just with the way they're thinking. And ESPN is like belatedly trying to catch up. And what's an example of that? The fact that they have a whole bunch of people in a room every night watching sports and whatever happens, they're just cutting this digital video that just goes out, you know, like some, some movie clip of, you know, that's tied into some Clay Thompson three point explosion. All of a sudden they had that clip out and it's shared, you know, a million times in, in 24 hours, they bought that house, a highlight site, which is one of the best highlight sites. Like they're doing the game of zones thing. Um, they're moving more toward that social side, which is also something Barstool is doing too, where they're just the engagement and the eyeballs and the, and it's, they're able to bring all this stuff for other things. And ESPN, now you go to their website, it's really hard to find stuff. You know, and I think that was one of the reasons they cut back on, they got rid of so many writers because they were probably like, we have to move towards social and mimic the Bleacher Report thing. We'll just have our signature dudes. We'll have like Zach Lowe and Ramona and Winhorst and Barnwell, Barnwell and a couple big ass uh, magazine people. We use the magazine people on the thing, on the uh, website. But for the most part, you go to that website now and it's like and it's videos and tweets. And vertical. And, and vertical, but vertical... Brian and I have talked about this. I feel like you're buying Woj's Twitter feed. Yeah. I don't know if you're buying actual stories. I mean, maybe they'll well, you're losing Mark Steins. Them. Well, you're losing Mark Stein. You lost Chad Ford. You lost uh, Henry. You lost a couple of true hoop people. That's the fascinating part about Woj is it's, he is a Twitter asset. I mean, he's a, he, he does a lot of things. He, he's not, he, when he did his special pirate radio draft show, the final one on ESP on uh, Yahoo, it was a four and a half hour show and the plan was for him to be on three times in the flesh in four and a half hours. Yeah. And the rest of the time they would just show his Twitter feed along the side and react to what the news he was breaking on Twitter, which is just a really postmodern thing. Like we got this guy, he's not in the flesh on our show, but his Twitter feed, which the whole world can find on its own, is the content driver of the show. But if I'm a Disney shareholder, I say, oh, wow, look, it's gotten, you know, 10,000 retweets or whatever. How, how does that, how is that monetized? It's, it's that's not, what, that's what it's I mean. It's a mistake. That's what I mean. And it doesn't, it's not saying anything about him as a reporter. It's just saying like, it's a weird thing to bring into your orbit because it's not the same as some of these other things we're talking but about. Hold Bill on Barnwell, now. everything, you know, he's tweeting a lot, but everything he's doing is writing daily for the website, right? That's just coming to you. I'm going to read Bill's column. But you, the, the, the thing that they care about is the ticker. They care about the scrolling thing in the bottom of the screen and, and who gets attributed to what. That seems like and an old media thing to care about. I know, but I think, that's, I think that was the biggest thing. I think last summer, from what I heard, um, when Woj really had like just an unbelievable summer, he was like, he was scooping them on every draft pick before the draft. Then free agency came. He was nailing a lot of the free agency stuff. And I think Skipper was like, what the hell? Like, we're the NBA is our sport. This guy's clearly killing us. Clearly bothered them. And yeah. they have to run on the ticker. They're running SportsCenter. They're running PTR, all that. And it says Yahoo's Adrian Wojnarowski reports. And it's just over and over again. I think they were like, screw this. We want that to be ESPN. Okay, so what's the financial advantage of if that? There's not. It's an ego thing. It's, it's, I, I don't know how you monetize it because like it's July 1st, they had him on TV a bunch. I, that's not how I would use him. I mean, Adam I Schefter is on television. All the time. A Adam Schefter is on, is on television Insiders, all the time. He's on and, Sunday mornings. I mean, it, it, well, he's a lot more polished than Woj is right now. I mean, Woj needs reps, but um, I didn't think that was a great use of Woj because Woj isn't on his phone. And they, you had Sham Sharania, his old protege, is breaking scoops because Woj is on TV for 10 solid minutes. He can't look at his phone. And then things are flying out. And I don't know. I don't, I don't. I didn't really get it, but I get it from the standpoint that they're probably thinking like, let's streamline our website. We have Zach, we have Windhorst, we have Ramona, um, Haverstrow, a couple of the True Hoop guys, and then information. And that's it. We don't care about anything else. I think it goes back to the investment in the NBA we're talking about. It's like, how can we sink that much money in the NBA and not have the alpha insider of the NBA? I would argue if you're spending $12 billion on the NBA, there sh should be room then for Mark Stein. That you have well, uh, that there, is. I'm there's, not there's that, and I, Chad and whatever. There's a healthy. But that's a different argument. I, I like the internal. I, I don't mind that two that you have two competing forces inside. If it, if if the if the world of the NBA is so big, then as long as these guys are good at what they do and they are, 
uh, why, why, why do you have to choose and why do you have to lose it? It's I mean, inexplicable, especially because they just gave Stein this huge contract last October. And they're going to pay him for the two way or three years not to work. And they, you know, they, they gave Jaws a giant contract and they're paying him How off. How about people who moved to Bristol because they were told to make the commitment and then they get laid off, uh, you know, the first year of the I think contract. It's, I think it's genuinely bizarre. And the way it's been explained to me is if they do it now, they can write off all these all these contracts that they're paying off a sunk cost for one year, yep. and then it comes off their budget going forward. I still don't understand how it doesn't. You're spending all this money anyway. Why wouldn't you have Mark Stein? You're already paying him. He breaks. He broke a ton of stories last month. I look at like Ed Werder started this podcast that he does now all the time, and with all these huge guests from the Cowboys and all this stuff. And I'm like, why isn't that on ESPN.com? Why wasn't that on ESPN.com before? Right. Or, or do or do like what that they, seems like a great use of his time. Or do what they did with. Had a storm where you you know you you kind of renegotiate the deal and you're not making um, yeah. as much as you used to, but you're still part of it. And uh, do you believe the conspiracy theories about Woj told them to get rid of people? Because I personally don't. I have something to add to that. Okay, ahead, let's hear. so in the in the white heat of it, in the moment, the day of the first day of the layoffs, I think it was our second day. It was that rolling three days of horror that we all experienced on Twitter. I heard from inside ESPN, this is a Woj thing. It's absolutely a Woj thing. Got to be a Woj. And people just absolute belief. I heard 24 hours ago, hold back on that a little bit. Maybe it's more complicated than that. Maybe there are not everything is, you know, you know, certainly like you talk about Stein, right? They wanted this NBA insider and not this NBA insider. That's clearly a decision. But I, I heard, I've heard pull back on that. I, I don't think that Woj would say, to ES okay, if I come, you got to clear the deck. I think, though, that ESPN might say to itself, if we're going to spend this money on him, we just can't afford and we don't have the bandwidth to even manage and to pay for these others. Um, I think it became a binary proposition, which it didn't have to be. I, I think it's I, some, I think it's a lot more complicated. I think it's a lot more complicated than the straight than the straight story. I, I believe that, too. Or they made the deal with them and then realized that the budget was just out of control and that they couldn't figure it out. And look, maybe they, I, if, if I'm Woj though, I mean, he has every right to say, look, if I'm going to come over, I don't want to be competing against somebody, a colleague like that. Uh, I mean, but you know, it's different. But, Remember Schefter Mort, you know, that was, a, that was a very, in a way, a, a similar situation, right? I, I mean, know, was, but they took him out back and now they're singing Kumbaya. I mean, they figured well, it they, out, but they figured it out amongst each other. And I right. think Mort was like, let's make this work together. We'll sit on the set together. We're going to make it work. And it, it did not work in this case. It did not. There was not that kumbaya moment. I don't even know if there was an attempt, though. There that, wasn't an attempt. That's the thing. I I'll don't believe there was thing. an it attempt. Was, it was weird at the finals. It was some of the weirdest energy I've ever felt in my life. You had Stein there and Woj. You had Henry Abbott there for one of the games. You had Sage Steele and Beetle like 10 feet apart from each other. You had me there. Cats and dogs were living <laughs> it was, together. It was, it was fucking crazy. <laughs> but uh, I, from a digital standpoint, I don't know what the hell ESPN's doing. And I just think it's a pretty big statement not to replace Kozner's job. That's That in itself, um, he had a big job. He and, had a huge and job. And it's not like digital is disappearing. No. So I think that when I saw the reorg, I think that was the thing that really took me aback. It's I a would, big decision. I, I think they've really missed the boat on stuff that I was complaining about when I was there. Like the East Pink could have just owned podcasts. They were they were there first. They were in the space. They had mine. You know, we at Grantland we had a lot of success with our pods early, but they were insisting on putting them on pod center instead of just floating them out all over the place. Um but it just, it just should have been a growth industry that really could have replaced ESPN Radio someday. I don't think they ever really understood how to didn't. sell it. They just, and, they didn't know what to do with it. And didn't, and it was a grain of sand on a beach. And so it wasn't a priority either. I told you this, they used to throw my podcast into their giant subway deal. I was like the free set of tires you got if you <laughs> invested. I want to ask for actual and, numbers, but percentage wise, uh, right now your podcast versus at ESPN. Well, let's do, let's do all of Grantland. I would say we make 10 times as much money on podcasts as Grantland did. Think about that. And this is just very basic, like, don't throw my, don't throw all of our podcasts in your subway deal that let us do mid rolls, all things that other people were doing that we're like, why can't we do this? But the thing is, 
they were they never cared about the small potato stuff because they're always so focused on the big potato stuff which was the big conundrum with Grantland. it was like this little boutique part of espn and skipper's just saying i want you guys to be rolling stone for this generation don't care about whatever but then when things start to flip they're like wow oh, why aren't you guys making more money it's like well we're not making more money because of this this and this so what do you think their attitude about undefeated is now well that i that's a great question undefeated and 538 there's no way those sites make money for them so i think you have them because you invested in them and in the undefeated's case there's you know there's there's real reasons why you would have a site like that i just don't know how they profit from it because especially now like you think like audio and video are the two ways to really kind of generate new income for a site and undefeated like i don't think they're in podcasts at all in a substantial way and i don't really have seen haven't really seen the videos from them either yeah 530 it's an old school more site. In pods to my to my reading anyway but but not in like a giant way but both of them are really text heavy sites and that's but they're you also have to, you have 538's to, a cost center man yeah that, that's a big they have more headcount than grantland did so like that's weird to me too like you can't afford mark's time but you can keep doing 538 and then defeated like I, I just don't know what the game plan is. That goes back to peacetime wartime to me. 538 feels like a peacetime acquisition, right? Growing. We can get in on analytics. We can get a little bit of that election thing, get Nate, you know, doing all these things. But in wartime, it's just a funnier when you're cutting all these people from the company, core people from the company. It's more That's, of an interesting fit. I'm not saying it shouldn't be there. I'm just saying it, it feels different, you know? Well, it's a leadership thing, too, because I always thought 538 was going to be baseball and politics. Those are two things they were great at. Well, it's Nate, and, Nate's pedigree. Yeah. And maybe you could branch out to all sports and politics. But then when they launched it, it was all these different things like food. And, and now it's kind of settled into what it should have been from the start. Um, undefeated, I, I still... My thing is, can you explain the site in a sentence? I don't totally understand. Like, what what is the ultimate mission of that site? Is it to... Is it news? Is it analysis is an entertainment it's it seems like it hasn't really figured out exactly what it is yet and i hope it does because i like some of the writers i have but what's the mission what do you think the mission is i think that uh, well aside from the obvious and the, the diversity part of it that's important to skipper i also feel like he, he believes the, there's a quality there's a pedigree to that operation um from top down that he wants to be associated with it's ironic given what happened to Grantland. Right. Um, that's the only thing. Um, you know, you try and find consistencies or rationales or whatever, and all of a sudden this one's sui generis, and, but this one's, I mean, that's part of the harder task when you're looking at ESPN as a, as a, as a whole beach. You know, we can always talk about the individual grains of sand, but look, every day for the last five years, Skipper has been making decisions. Yeah. He and his team have been making decisions. Um, sometimes you understand them, sometimes you don't. Sometimes there are things going on that we know that they can't even talk about right. that they do. Sometimes it's because a particular executive has decided to go deep for that site and you want to support that executive even though it may not be the right financial uh, decision. The question is how, how much of that stuff can continue given the diminishing pile and the pressure on the bottom line. My guess with Undefeated is it'll eventually, it'll end up being more player heavy, almost like a, be a better version of the Players Tribune mm -hmm. with like a lot more stuff where you're a lot, you're, you're um, forming alliance with different players and doing projects with them because that's- It's like when Jordan, at, when Jordan wanted to talk about police shootings, right? Yeah. That's where he went. Right. You know, um, something like that. Maybe or like something. LeBron's interrupt, uninterrupted, these little players tribune, there's these little satellite industry now of players who are just bypassing the media completely and getting their message out. I, I think that would be where the undefeated, that would be their big growth spot is how do we align with players and do different projects with them? But the question is that, you know, it's going to be expensive. All of these players always have an angle. They have some, they want to cut up stuff. They think stuff is worth more than it is. And, um, and the question is, are we six months away from a massive meeting at ESPN where they have to figure out that they can only be in business on profitable 
enterprises and perhaps even significantly profitable enterprises. Right. Versus and, like 30 for 30, I don't think gets greenlit now. Right? No. In 2008, when we were pitching that. Or maybe on a very limited basis, just as a celebration almost. And then. But that was a, that was a $15 million project that really was going to cost 20, not to mention all the marketing and all the other stuff. And they just had to write the check for it. No, There's no way they would do that now. No way. No. I think I could see them doing big ass one-off documentary projects that they could figure out how to sell and market like the Michael Jordan documentary that's been pitched around for yeah, two but, years. I mean, but now, I mean, Connor's not going to oversee the demise of 30 for 30. Yeah, but 30 for 30 was never supposed to have a third series. Well, I mean, I know we're going to talk about that on your podcast, but we had 30 for 30 ended. The people that were running EOE at the time didn't want it to come back because it wasn't their idea and shifted to this ESPN films presents was going to be the new brand. Everyone was calling them 30 for 30. So it was like, what the hell are we doing? Let's just do 30 for 30 again. We sent them a big pitch, Connor and I, in uh, end of 2011. Here's what series two would look like. That got greenlit. That was supposed to be the last one. And then we wanted to do one multi-part series that was initially going to be Tyson and became OJ. But I, I, now I feel like it's How just about gonna, 35. Not, oh, the ESPN 35 idea. Oh, yeah, we talked about that. Yeah, that, was, that wasn't from our, our center of the thing. How about but, those? but that's a good example of what I, one of the things that I think happened because Skipper didn't have his right-hand guy or his right-hand lady. Um, you had all these different little satellites underneath him, all fighting for territory and, and doubling down on the territory they already had and trying to grab other people's territory. Like in 2012, Connor and I really want to do 30 for 30 shorts. And we just felt like that streaming had gotten to the point where we could do shorts. It was, it, we had all these ideas that weren't good enough for a 30 for 30. That could be like five minutes, 10 minutes. We felt like we could, could be a big part of Grantland. We wanted to premiere my Grantland and the company was aligned behind it. And it was like, all right, we're going to do shorts in this spot. And we would always talk like we had done a couple of shorts for Grantland too. And, Connor and I would have these philosophical discussions on should that just be short? Should we just 30 for 30 shorts on that space? Within two years, E60 had shorts, Sports Center featured, um, 538, ESPNW. Like we couldn't stop it. We couldn't, we couldn't keep that corner yeah. because all these other people were like, well, we want that territory. And maybe that's the way it should have gone. But it was just really hard to, for the whole company to align behind anything. Well, you, you just touched on something, though, that I think is a real fascinating aspect of ESPN, which is there's a, a really powerful duality to the ESPN culture, because when it's somebody attacking Bristol, it can be a pretty unified place. Yeah. I mean, aside from I like a that couple- the hard way. Right. But aside from a couple of disgruntled people, which you're always, you're always going to find, sure. like by and large, it can be pretty, pretty unified. But if <clears> somebody's <throat> not attacking it within, it's incredibly, not only competitive, but sometimes to- I mean, there's such a sense of ownership and such competitiveness within ESPN itself that nine times out of 10, they just wind up shooting themselves in, in the foot because uh, just like ESPN 35 is a perfect example of that because it's more about one individual part of that culture or that operation wanting to own it and not having, you know, somebody else do it. And I mean, so for the listeners that's that part don't of the know, legacy of you with NBA countdown. Well, for the listeners that don't know spring of 2014, we caught wind, Connor and I caught wind of this ESPN 35 idea that basically ripped off our 30 for 30 memo and everything. <laughs> Just by changing a number. They out, changed yeah. the number, but it's saying it was like 35 documentaries about 35 years at ESPN. And we're like, Great what idea. the fuck is this? But also you guys were never in contact. You weren't part of it. We it wasn't like told, a memo. We, right. we found out from sales because sales was trying to sell it. And we had a friend at sales who emailed Connor and was like, do you guys know about this? Meanwhile, the memo had in the pitch multiple topics that we were already developing for 30 for 30. <laughs> So we were like, what the hell? And and we had to spend all this political capital trying to squash it. And that was, Connor and I would do this good guy, bad guy cop thing, which is one of the reasons he's kept ascending. I was always the bad guy. I, I would be the one that sent the angry email and Connor would be kind of the smoother over after. Um, 
but we we squashed that. But it was like, can you imagine if they had launched ESPN 35 as we're doing 30 for 30? Well, I can imagine How that, but not, would that have been? not having <laughs> you guys part not of it. Not having us in. We just like we the knowledge base and also we were just, the best at it. Yeah. That's, so, but that's, it that's a good example. And I really think like when I look at what's happening to ESPN now, I could see all the seeds of it. Um, just all hell breaking loose. Wait, we have one more thing to talk about, but. By the way, that's why you're looking. That's one of Connor's, I think, most important challenges, which is. Well, he's going to have to pick sides now. To, he was always that, able to straddle right. all the fences. Uh, let's talk about propercloth.com. Every guy knows it's hard to find a dress shirt that fits. Curtis pulls his collar. Maybe the collar's too tight, the sleeves are too long, the shirt's too loose. I have some good news. Ordering a custom fit shirt has never been easier thanks to proper cloth. Do you know about proper cloth? No. Create a custom shirt size in seconds by answering 10 easy questions, no measure required. Choose from over 20 collar styles, 10 cuff styles, 500 fabric styles from classic to business. Get the style you want, all high quality with the absolute best quality craftsmanship. Starting at just $80, proper cloth guarantees a perfect fit, meaning if you somehow don't have your shirt fit proper perfectly. They will remake it for free. Stop wearing shirts that don't fit. Look your best. Go to propercloth.com slash BS. Enter gift code BS. Save $20 on your first shirt again. Propercloth.com slash BS. Gift code BS. I want to talk about two people that um, got bounced last month that both were my bosses. And I was shocked. Marie Donahue and John Kozner. Um, Kozner, you, you have been pretty clear did not want to report to connor and you think that's why he's left you there are you 100 percent sure that's the reason uh well no i haven't sat down with john and had him look me in the face and say that i mean i've heard that from s several people and i think it i think it makes sense um both for skipper creating that architecture and for kozner to say i, I don't want to do it you know um i I, I understand both perspectives. So Marie was a business strategy and eventually got more and more control over stuff and eventually became um, the boss of ESPN Films, so Connor, Grantland, 538, and eventually The Undefeated and was in charge of content. Well, there was something else too, though. She was arguably... You know john skipper's the conciliary the, 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 yes I john mean, walsh was a con his conciliary forever john walsh started getting started fading out around 2012 2013 by the spring of 2015 he was retired but he was really had faded away a little but bit marie Marie's had become a much bigger blip on the radar oh yeah dating dating back to you know 12 even um and 13 and he kept on giving her a lot of responsibility and also when people would try to go to him as the court of last appeals, I think it's pretty safe to say that, you know, he supported her um, myriad ways and uh, was was very, very, uh, I, I think, you know, probably her biggest fan of the company. That's a big deal. Is it fair to say that she knew where all the bodies were buried? Um, <laughs> Including all the Grayland bodies? <laughs> Just, I mean, she was... I think it's conciliary. I, I think I think Skipper was probably more transparent with Marie yeah. than maybe anybody else. This was a shocker. This 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 was a shocker. And I think that I think this is the one that hurt Skipper the most for a variety of reasons. I think he Number one, I, that if she wasn't a white male, which is basically everybody around him now except for Rob King. Right. I, I do think he really believed in her. I think he really enjoyed her. I think there was a true friendship. And I think that that was the hardest part about this this new organization, I think, was was letting her go. What do you think the reasons were? Well, you know, let's start with this. I, I think that if you, somebody, you know, I wrote a piece for the Loud Reporter about it, and uh, somebody said, well, I thought you were being a little sexist on it, or that Skipper was being sexist about it. Uh, I, I don't think that was the case at all. I, I think that she certainly had a portfolio and a position that it's a meritocracy and you talk about that. I mean, Marie had, I think she had hits and misses. And I think that the hits, uh, I think unfortunately for her, didn't garner a lot of, enough of attention from the people within ESPN. And I think the misses garnered a lot. 
And I also feel, and I know this because there were people who said this to me, that they did not want to report to her anymore um, and had a hard time working with her. Now, I'm sure she's got, just like she did with Grantland, I'm sure she's got a compelling point of view herself. And I know that she really, she worked her butt off and she cared a lot, but I think that that was probably one of the legacies. Um, you know, about, about behind this uh, decision. I was going to say, and the misses were very public misses, you know, where somebody, somebody like that who would not be a well-known executive to the outside world in the wake of the Grantland thing. And of course, we're in the tank on this, but she then becomes this figure to people on Twitter, to people looking to be angry about that in a way that an ESPN executive normally wouldn't. I, I will say this, though, in her defense. Look, I mean, we all know the Grantland story. These were, this was the deep end of the pool, though. I mean, for someone who had been a business in the business world, even though she had the job and it was her responsibility, when all of a sudden you let, you're gone and you walk into that Grandland office, I, I mean, there are very few people who would know how to play it right, right from the beginning. Now, there were certain mistakes that she made, and I know that you know them, and I know you think she made certain things worse, granted, but I'm just saying, let's just say that some of the things that um, she got caught up in were really, they, they were tough. They, were, they weren't hanging curves over the plate. They were like a Rivera splitter. I mean, this, is, this was tough. We got along for a long time. I think it's really hard to be a leader and be in charge. There's a leadership component to being a boss. And you look at what happened with Grantland, especially all of a sudden I'm gone. Nobody knows what happened, what the future of the site is, all that stuff. And the way it was handled just wasn't good. I, it's a site that, I mean, the ringer shouldn't even exist. If they, if they had handled Grantland correctly, the Grantland would still be there. And it would have grown and it had all the people in place. Like we had created something that had kind of surpassed me being there. All the, all the pieces were there. And I'm not saying that's the number one. Do you think one. the staff felt that, Bill, in honesty? Well, I think the staff was upset with how it was handled. I think that that caused so much damage. But, I mean, there was a way. I feel like there was a way to save that. Then you needed to, uh, no offense, then you needed to say that, that to the staff because you were so inextricably linked with with Grandland. And there were a lot of people that they were, they were young. They did not see a way out without you being there well Kurt, curtis knows i was emailing saying hey man we create i emailed everybody we created this site it's your job to protect it and keep it and keep it great indeed i wanted it to, i wanted it to be, still be great then all the stuff they did over the summer it was like wow and and the morale was so low um so would you you're like if i posit that they replaced instead of going with Chris, they went with Sean, and Sean took over right after you left. Is it still around? Yes. I don't think it don't is. Don't me. I think it is. <laughs> no, that's that's a pretty powerful argument. I, I think mean, that's it a is. position. Well, that's interesting. Um, but I just want. I mean, you know, look where ESPN is now after the cuts. You know, I, I mean, it's it's hard to imagine the Grim Reaper not coming and looking at something. Well, weren't we just thing. talking about undefeated in five thirty eight? Yeah. Well, yeah, but 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 what? But without Bill, I mean, I think it's like, you know, the, the post Bill Graham, like, oh, well, we created this with Bill and then it goes on and, oh, we need to cut somewhere. Right. You know? And I think that's how a lot yeah. of people felt. The other thing is they had every department has headcounts and they needed the headcounts for undefeated. One skipper really fully committed to it. I think that was really, and they weren't honest about that. I, I wanted to do a headcount column though about Grantland and 538 because I thought that was fascinating when there were a couple of times when you, I know you guys were asking for more and it was a no. And then all of a sudden, but 538 was getting it, which, well, and that's you know, why before so, you left, that was a, that's a pretty big decision right there in and of itself. I had a, I had a decision to make. I was at South by Southwest was talking to Peter Kafka at recode and he was doing a thing about how our on the road podcast and how our podcast was doing. I felt like, I felt like the staff that we had with the content we were putting up, I could see people starting to burn out and I didn't think it was sustainable. Like if we weren't going to grow and add people and I, I just was really starting to get worried about, um, kind of the mental health of the staff. And so I said in that thing, like, we got to keep growing. I, there were things I didn't know though, at the time I didn't know about 
I didn't know that about the cord cutting thing. I didn't know it was as bad as they were starting to realize like spring of 2015 that the cord cutting thing was a real thing, that they were going to have to have legitimate budget things. We had always been told from day one, we want you to be Rolling Stone for the internet. Um, we want you to do great stuff. Like even 2014, we had almost hired Lee Jenkins. You know, Nate initially was supposed to be on Grantland. We, we were still moving and trying to make things. We did a big deal with Matt Taibbi to write stories for us like that, that fall. But you we, were aware of the fact that 538 was getting resources that you couldn't get. I was, but I, at the same time, I really liked Nate. I wanted his site to succeed. What, what didn't make sense to me was when we had this headcount thing in like March and, then, and we, needed, we needed a social person. Like social was a big thing for us. We needed to really boost up our social and get our stuff out. And they just, they didn't give us any headcount. And I, I knew what was going on with the other ones, but I think that most of that was about me, right? They felt like I was leaving. I think they, they felt like I was going to leave at the end of my contract. We're not helping Grant Leonard anymore. I think the final year uh, that you were at ESPN Post -suspension. was a very, very difficult year. And uh, I don't blame them for playing it that way. If they felt like I was going to leave, why are they going to keep sinking resources into Grant Leonard? Well, I just think that that was the time, though, to, for them at least, to come up with, or for you guys together, to come up with a bold new financial arrangement whereby you could have stayed. I think it was just too simplistic to say, oh, you know what, we're, you know, he's already making this much money and we're not going to be able to pay what we think he can get on the quote unquote market. And so to be a little bit more entrepreneurial about it, break some roles, do some things with revenue sharing and other things that you sometimes have to do when somebody outgrows, you know, the, the current. Uh, they thought I was leaving to start a company with Connor. Well, there were reasons that they thought that. I know. <laughs> and they're, they're not, Where'd they get that okay, idea? Uh, you know, let's just, <laughs> yeah, let's be honest about that. This is getting deep. This is like say. beyond inside baseball. Uh, but anyway, know. with the Marie thing, I, I don't think that helped, but I, I just, I, I mean, don't why think, do you she, think she left. I don't think she should have been in charge in content. I think she was a brilliant business person. I think, I think she got miscast and, um, and I think she got miscast partly because he had done a poor job of building his inner circle around him. And there were people he could have promoted that he didn't. I think he could have leaned on Connor a lot sooner than he did. I remember Connor almost left in 2012 or 13. I can't remember. And 13, 13. and 14 and 15. No, but 13, 16. he was almost out the door <laughs> and you know, I was like, why am I the only one fighting for, for Connor and sending long emails about why they have to keep him? It was like, he was one of the only young executives they had who actually had a sense of content. And, uh, I don't know. It's just, everybody's boxing everybody out. And it's just, I think in fairness also to Marie, when you get parachuted into the content world, it, there are things about it that are just so unique. And I mean, that's why like a Libby guy, you know, growing up in there and you see her career, the way it's flourishing and you see how amazing she's becoming, you know, she's, I'm not saying she's a better executive. I'm just saying though, that you spending that time in the trenches and then moving up forward and moving up forward. It's not only that your colleagues understand that you've paid your dues, but you've actually seen what some of these jobs require. So when you're yeah. Talking about it from a management point of view, you have a have a keener sense of it. Um, I think it was very difficult. Um, you know, I would still say it had to have gotten. I haven't been there for two years. It had to have gotten really bad. That Marie like had to go. I was surprised by that. You're talking like inner circle for a skipper in 2012. Walsh, Marie, Kozner. Those were his. Those were his three. They're all gone now. Um, one other thing he never did that, I, that George always had was that chief of staff. He always had somebody, George, the best one was Laura Gentile who, who ended up going to, uh, run an ESPNW, oh, yeah, but yeah. George would have a chief of staff. So he'd have these meetings and he'd be like, all right, you're meeting with baseball at 10 o'clock. Then you're meeting with ESPN Deportes at 12 and he'd have the chief of staff of them. And before the meeting, it'd be like, all right. You're meeting with uh, Bill Simmons about Grantland. Here are the four bullet points, blah, blah, blah. He's going to want to talk about this, 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 and this. Skipper would just go. He didn't have anybody. Well, but also it was, it was 
it was how they arranged the organization, right? Because it's just like President of the United States. You have a very uh, vertical one, like Eisenhower used to sit atop, just like he was like commander right. in chief. And so everything kind of filtered up. Nixon was like that. And then you have somebody like Bill Clinton, who basically you create an X and he wants his desk right in the middle. Right. And he wants to be able to do it. He wants transparency. The other, and that's what Skipper was. And by the way, Skipper prided himself on anybody could get to him. Right. And, but and that, he but was his job was too big, though. The, the job was too big. So you look at the NBA, right? You go to any NBA Finals game. You'll see Adam anywhere with Adam Silver, All-Star Weekend, whatever. There's a guy right next to him wearing a suit who's carrying a big thing. His name is Jared. I've known him forever. He's Adam's chief of staff. Right. Every place Adam goes, Jared goes. Right, it's like the and football. And he's prepping right? the him, getting him ready. Yeah, I was say the nuclear codes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's yeah. just, dude, this, we got to go here. You're the, he's prepping him. I, I remember sending an email to Skipper once being like, that should be Connor. Connor should just go wherever you go and prep you and be your chief of staff. But he just didn't want it. Well, he can't, you know, look, Skipper is what, 62, 61, whatever. He, yeah. He, you don't, you can't change just because the job changes. You can do certain things, but Skipper, his whole life has been very, he, by the way, he's a lot quicker decision maker than George was. He likes to be more face to face. He's, he's going, you know, a million miles a minute and he feels comfortable with that. And so that's his model. I mean, I totally understand that. It's just that I think that, you know, the legacy is that he really, he didn't understand how big it was. I still think he's a brilliant content guy. He's, I wish. Yeah. I, the things he did were, you know, the the fact that he greenlit 30 for 30, I think is still incredible. And I just don't think anyone else would have greenlit that. And so it do you think no he's, sense. he's got a contract coming up? Do you think he stays? Well, now definitely. He, I mean, that was part of the genius of what he did, right? I think so. Do you think as, as an innocent bystander, <laughs> these next two, three years determine on whether the skipper thing was a success or not? Or do you feel Absolutely. like the declining subs and all that stuff, it's like already... Not a success. Oh, no. He's got time. He's got time to to, to change the narrative. As what it were. do you think are the two things ESPN needs to do next two years? Ooh. What, would, what would be your two priorities if you were Skipper's new chief of staff? Figure out, <clears throat> well, I don't know if timing in two years is going to be rights deals, but figure out the way forward on that. What you're going to pick, what, what Jim was talking about earlier. Where are you going to double down? Where are you going to just abandon and say, we can't do it? got to go we got to get out of this these businesses and then you know figuring out the i mean it's the big question it's like what's the existential question of espn how are we going to pay for this what are we going to do how are we going to make money how are we going to satisfy the uh, howling masses on wall street you know how are we going to how are we going to continue to monetize the company do you buy this whole this new espn streaming channel they're going to open that has all content that's not on espn it's like cricket and all this different stuff you look i don't I, see how that works maybe not but I think they're at a period right now where they're willing and almost feel that they need to throw a lot of stuff at the wall and see what sticks. And, you know, and by the way, even if it's not a gigantic home run, they're all, they should be in the singles and doubles business. That yeah. speaks to your point about podcast years exactly. ago, because they weren't, they were just thinking about home runs. And so now if you get in early on something and it's, you know, even if it's a smaller piece of the pie, if it's profitable and it has a growth strategy behind it, great. Let's do that. Let's do that. Let's do that. So I think that in in that regard, they're probably being smart, which is they're not trying to just look for one thing that's going to all of a sudden turn it around, which, by the way, makes the message that they have to give Disney to give Wall Street all the harder. Well, yeah, I also think a big challenge for them going forward and a challenge for the last couple of years has been finding new talent. And you look at like all the talent that they either found or developed from. But define talent now because the notion of talent is changing. I'm saying people that either draw eyeballs to a computer screen or draw ears to a radio or a podcast or, um, you know, can be somebody on air. And I just think, I, I think from a finding talent standpoint, can they have you? been really lacking the last couple of years. So. Dare we say Katie Nolan? I mean, I mean, sure. But that's is that finding talent though. I'm well, saying developing talent, F finding somebody who has potential and developing them into an asset. You know, it's like Katie's a known commodity. Well, she it's hasn't been on the air since the Clinton. You know, I, I mean, it's been it's been a long time. But she's figuring out what to do with her. I think is right. the question, right? What does she want to do, and what what would she be best doing over there? But she's known. 
I'd say the talent they've developed lately is like Pablo Torre, you know, magazine to around the horn guest it's a good to has his own show coming up in the new in the new regime, right? Mina Kimes is on that same kind of path, right? Yeah. Magazine, great writer, around the horn guest, you know, who knows next. But you know, it's with, on ESPN radio. But know? with Katie, I mean, you know Katie and a lot of people on Twitter know Katie, but I think Katie's got another level jump in her oh. that that's possible if somebody can figure out what she should be doing. I totally doing agree. Right. That was I was gonna, the first person to try to hire. They wouldn't trade. Who who wouldn't they trade for? Her? Oh, that's right. That's they right. Wouldn't trade that NASCAR guy for her, Marty Smith. <laughs> yep. Fox was like, "We'll do it. Let us have Ian Dark for some soccer stuff, and let us have Marty Smith, and we'll give you Katie." And Wild Hack said no, and now he's the athletic director at Syracuse. Needed Oswald the Rabbit in that deal. Could have pulled it off. I should have. I should have thrown a couple more things in there. Um, I think that I think they need to continue to find talent, especially in the digital side, because, you know, um, talent's out there. Go find some, go find some people. Who's the next generation of ESPN? Well, they, I mean, look, they you, changed you, their approach with this. Three hour show around Mike Greenberg. Three hours. I don't want to spend three hours with anyone. <laughs> three hours is like a, a ride from Boston to New York. And that is, uh, I think, that's the that's the first plate on Connor's table. I think it's a big one. If you're head of content and you have a guy you're paying over six and a half million dollars a year for, and mm. you're going to give him three hours every day, that thing better work. And that to me, that shows all about sidekicks. Well, I think who I is think, the person? Who are the person and people sitting next to him? But the thing is, if if you're gonna, all right. So I agree with you. But if you're gonna, if you need to make that show work by having ten other people on it that you have to give new contracts to, then why did you choose right. the idea in the first place? I'm just saying where we are now. Yeah. It's about casting the sidekicks correctly. Whether Katie has a big role in that, if not a regular role in that, who is sitting next to him to me is a huge question. I don't think it's gonna be Katie. She'll be on it though if she's on ESPN. They've got to put her on it. I know there was, you know, at first Sage was going to be on it. Now Sage is not going to be on it. Um, you know, I think they're still figuring things out. By the way, it starts soon. <laughs> you seem skeptical. And I, you know what? I, I think it's a, you're climbing Everest on a cold day in your shorts. <laughs> um, I, I, I mean, only because it's three hours and it's a, it's an expensive show. It's not to say that I don't have faith and Connor or Bill or Greeny or whatever, but it's, that's going to be a tough one. That's not an easy show to do. It's just not. Are, have they just, what are they doing with ESPN radio? I don't know, radio all over the place. Radio is just, I don't, I mean, it's almost like podcasts are going to. God, it, it had that great decade or two and, you know, ESPN brought it back to life and, you know, Oberman launched it and it was, yeah. there were so many great, sure. I mean, the heydays of. It's so fascinating radio. the local markets. They're like not even in the top 40 with shows in, in these major cities because everyone just wants to hear their own. If you're in Dallas, you just want to hear about the Mavericks and the Cowboys and the, <laughs> the, the just Texas the Cowboys Rangers. actually. But yeah. yeah, just the Cowboys. <laughs> and the little Mavericks, a little Dennis <laughs> yeah. One segment a week. Um, <laughs> thanks again to Proper Cloth. Ordering a custom fit shirt has never been easier thanks to Proper Cloth. Create a custom shirt size in seconds. Answer 10 easy questions. Custom shoes over 20 collar styles. 10 cuff styles, 300 different fabrics, classic to business. Look your best. Go to propercloth.com slash BS. Enter gift code BS to save $20 on your first shirt. Thanks to Bowl and Branch. Great sleep. Starts with the right sheets. Do you have the right sheets, Joe? I, th I think so. Uh, I'm hoping. You have the right sheets, Brian? Yeah, yeah I'm, in the, I'm in the ballpark. They're more affordable than you think with Bowl and Branch. Go to bowlandbranch.com today to get their 100% organic cotton-crafted sheets, and you'll get $50 off your first set of sheets plus free shipping when you use the promo code BS. So you write another ESPN book, maybe? Maybe. There's a lot that happened since the last one. I'm excited for the ESPN The Book movie. ESPN, the is that book, happening? The movie. Is that is there a chance? I hope so. We got it. We got a we got a lead. Can Matthew lead Perry in. play me? <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say, how much time have you spent thinking about who will play you in this movie? Though? Well, that might not be Can Matthew Perry. Twenty five year old Matthew Perry pay me? Uh, no. Yeah, I'm trying to think. What what age am I in the ESPN? Oh, this is set in the seventies though. A seventy eight. I mean eighties, early eighties, no. right? You're a child you actor know. watching television. I'm a child actor. I'm I'm being played by uh, one of the guys on a Disney show. One of the kids. <laughs> Actually, I went with your dad. You My know, dad should be in the ESPN. Better character, sorry. Yeah. 
He's he's st still a signature podcast guest for me. Brian, thank you. Thank you. Um, as always. Really good job, by the way. Brian wrote a great piece about um, how Trump is creating a whole new uh, generation of media stars, which is true. He's I, it was, it was, what I, one of the reasons I love that piece is I had never thought about it until you laid it out. And I'm like, yeah, he's right. These are all people that just weren't that important 12 months ago. Yeah. I didn't know who Maggie Haberman was. I just love the idea Haberman that, was. I mean, I know we're in a time when good news travels slow, but I, I just think that uh, this whole dynamic, at 10 o'clock at night to watch what's going on between the New York Times and the Washington Post makes you feel like, you know, I mean, that must have been like what it was like in the 70s. And, yeah. uh, you know, Spielberg's doing this movie about Mrs. Graham, no. which is like perfect timing. But yeah. it is unbelievable if you watch, if you, every single night, there's, there's, there's the journalism and uh, the breaking news is it's pretty compelling. Yeah. It's the age of the heroic journalist, the heroic political journalist. Again, that's why Spielberg's doing this movie, because the way we think about the people covering Trump, he is evoking that by the people that cover Nixon by doing the movie. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks for doing this, guys. Oh, thanks this for is fun. Me. I wonder when we'll reconvene the three men. What else needs to happen? This is the last big shakeup for a while, right? Connor's now the the second skipper. Skipper always needed. Yep, I guess. Uh, you don't think there's going to be another massive layoff thing coming, do you? I don't know. Oh, no. I, I don't know. Uh, uh, I oh, really no. don't know. I mean, I listen. I'm not trying to scare anybody right i i have no i just have no idea i hope not i certainly hope not because they seem pretty adamant it was done that lord willing i mean i uh, certainly don't don't want any more um you know it's it's weird because we see these headlines sometimes you know u.s steel or ford lays off thirty-two thousand or whatever you know 300 people at espn two years ago it was just inconceivable it was inconceivable yeah. and people are still feeling it and then this hundred that just went bye-bye i remember when they liquidated the eoe group which we were sharing an office with at grantland in 2011 that was like i think like 22 people and that felt like the biggest most a, important thing that had happened 300 is insane i remember when ratings went down though and it was one of the reasons why bodenheimer gave shapiro you know programming and production the ratings were really bad and they were starting to think about that back then yeah and uh i mean you got to credit shapiro because I mean, from a ratings point of view, boy, it really turned things around. Juiced it for, yeah, two years. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. <laughs>